Today, the United States of America takes what it hopes will be one of the final steps up to the moon. It's a vitally important step. At Cape Kennedy, Florida, the time is just after 10 o'clock in the morning. The weather conditions are said to be good. In one hour from now, this Saturn 1B rocket will lift off from the launch pad, at first painfully slowly. Within minutes, it will be in orbit over Ascension Island, traveling at a speed of 17,500 miles an hour. On board will be these three men, astronauts Walter Cunningham, Walter Chirac in command, and Don Iselli. All the three of them. Three men. Three men to ring out this new spacecraft for the first time. In the left seat, spacecraft commander Walter Chirac. In the right seat, Walter Cunningham. And in the middle, a young man from Columbus, Ohio, Major Don Isley. The quiet, reserved man in the center couch seems natural here, contrasted with the outgoing exuberance of his teammates. A relaxed pilot, they call him. Confident. Confident in his own ability and in the ability of his teammates. But the road to becoming an astronaut is neither short nor easy. For Don Isley, it began with his graduation from Annapolis in 1952, when he chose a flying career in the Air Force. He became a project officer and test pilot for experimental jets, and it was as a test pilot he was selected for the astronaut program 12 years later in 1964. He came on board with a third contingent of astronauts, the same group as his fellow crew member, Walt Cunningham. Someone once said that if Mr. Walter Cunningham of Santa Monica, California, were ever marooned on the moon, he's the kind of man who'd find a way to walk back to Earth. He has an abundance of energy and personal drive, combined with an alert and perceptive intellect. He is known as an astronaut who is determined to do everything well, from his physical training to mastering the esoteric complexities of the Apollo mission to send men to the moon and back. These personal traits were evident when he began flight training with the U.S. Navy in 1952. He then spent three years on active duty with the U.S. Marine Corps and is the only one of his class of astronauts who is in the reserve forces of this country. He's a major in the Marine Corps Reserve. He resigned from the Marines to go back to college and earn his Master of Arts degree at UCLA. One of the space experiments he worked on as a postgraduate student later flew on NASA's first orbital geophysical observatory. He had completed all requirements for his doctorate degree except his thesis when he was selected as an astronaut by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. In the third class of 14 astronauts which NASA began training in the fall of 1963, he was one of two civilians selected from hundreds of applicants. Early in 1964, he got his first look inside the gates at Cape Kennedy, at Pad 19, and at one of the Saturn series of boosters being groomed for the Apollo project. Along with his fellow astronauts, Cunningham spent eight hours a day for six months of academic instruction in such subjects as flight mechanics, astrophysics, geology, and celestial navigation. Walter Marty Sherrard, Jr. of Oradell, New Jersey, is known as an engineer's astronaut. People who work with him call him affable, unflappable, witty, easygoing, and above all, cool and professional when the chips are down and there's a job of precision flying to be done. He and fellow astronauts Gordon Cooper and the late Virgil Grissom are the only three of the original seven astronauts who flew both Mercury and Gemini missions. Wally Shira brings to Project Apollo not only a wealth of spaceflight experience, but also a long record of consistently high performance that dates all the way back to his service in the Navy. After graduation from the United States Naval Academy in 1945, Shira, as an Air Force exchange pilot, flew F-84 jets against fast-flying Russian MiGs over Korea. He logged 90 combat missions and earned the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with Cluster. Following the Korean armistice, he became a Navy test pilot. 
1959, the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration selected Shira as an astronaut from a list of 508 highly qualified candidates. Along with Deke Slayton, Gus Grissom, Alan Shepard, Scott Carpenter, John Glenn, and Gordon Cooper, he entered the intensive training for the Project Mercury one-man space flights. His first turn came in October of 1962 when he was selected as pilot of the fifth U.S. manned space flight. He explains how he came to name his Mercury spacecraft. Sigma 7 is a name to me that connotes an engineering symbol. It is the 18th letter of the Greek alphabet, and it also connotes summation. Basically, what we wanted to come up with this name was the very many inputs that have been brought forward to develop this flight. The fact that we had previous flights where we needed to make our initial steps into space. The fact that we had operations analyses of the previous flights, engineering analyses, that we had to make minor changes to make the previous problems of earlier flights straighten out. This, in truth, was the reason why I have been calling this Sigma or engineering. successful, the people of NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, are going to study the possibility of making the Apollo 8 flight in December, a one, uh, a, a round trip to the moon, a flight around the moon and back. And the Russians are very close to doing that too, we believe. So we may be in a real neck and neck race with the Russians for that uh, great dramatic first in space. See? I report now that we are go for a launch at this time. So the launch should come. Uh, at this point in the countdown, now if we uh, will be coming up uh, on the five minute mark. We'll be ready to retract that Apollo access arm to its full retract position. It has been on a standby position some three feet from the command module up to this time. We have now armed the ignition system of the Saturn 1B launch vehicle. This means that it can now receive the signals to ignite those engines at the proper time in the countdown, which will come at the three-second mark. We'll be coming up on some final status reports at this time. T-minus five minutes, 15 seconds and counting. The mission director, Bill Snyder, has given a go for the launch. The first uh, critical moment of this launch comes uh, after the actual liftoff, one minute and 15 seconds into the flight. That's when the rocket goes through the maximum dynamic pressure. It's about eight miles up and two miles down range. It's going around 1,600 miles an hour, and it's uh, quite critical. It gets the maximum buffeting then uh, as it kind of crosses the sound barrier. And then uh, at two minutes and 14 seconds, the pitch program is terminated. It's now in and the flight uh, will carry it into orbit. And then uh, two minutes and 23 seconds, the inboard engines of the first stage cut out. A couple, three seconds later, the outboard engines cut out. The rocket is then 38 miles high and 37 miles downrange, running at fire 5,200 miles an hour. Uh, the separation takes place immediately thereafter. Separation of the first stage. And four seconds later, the second stage engine ignites. This is the final launch control. Now T minus four minutes, seven seconds, and counting. Spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin has told Commander Walter Shirai, you are go for the launch. Shirai reported that all looks good. 
We have now armed the destruct system of the two stages of the Saturn 1B launch vehicle, and we'll be coming up about a minute from this time on the automatic sequencer. From that time down, we will be completely automatic in the launch vehicle. We're now at 3 minutes, 40 seconds, and counting. This is launch control. After the uh, ignition of the second stage engine, the launch escape tower, that's that little business right up at the top of the rocket, that little tower at the top, looks like a television tent or something, it uh, jettisoned 15 seconds after the second stage ignites. Then the spacecraft at four minutes into flight reports its go, no go condition. It does that every minute. That is the command pilot sure uh, reads out his instrument and says everything is working well. Minute mark in the count, several seconds from this time. Mark, T minus three minutes and counting. T minus three, we are continuing. The astronauts in the spacecraft having just completed some final checks of the guidance and navigation system. We're now two minutes, 50 seconds, coming up shortly on the automatic sequencer. The astronaut aboard advisory system is in effect at this time to keep people here at the launch complex ready to advise. Now T minus two minutes, 35 seconds and counting. It appears that the automatic sequencer is in at this time. T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. At this point, the various uh, tanks in the two stages of the Saturn one vehicle are starting to pressurize. We pressurize these tanks with helium. They're pressurized, of course, to force the various propellants into the engine chambers uh, for the proper ignition. The S-1B first stage fuel tank is pressurized and the second uh, stage liquid oxygen tank pressurizing at this time. Now coming up on the two minute mark, T minus two minutes and counting, T minus two. Not as much uh, reports now on the uh, communication circuits as everybody stands by monitoring the various consoles and watching the various parameters to ensure everything is okay. T minus one hour, one minute, 43 seconds and counting. We are still proceeding. And just at this That's moment, nice a great gust of wind sweeps our crust down here. Second mark in our countdown. Mark, T minus 90 seconds and counting. T minus 90. We have conditioned the liquid oxygen in the first stage of the Saturn launch vehicle. All, all tanks in the two stages now pressurizing. Most of the work over these final several minutes concerned with the launch vehicle directed by the test conductor, Don Carlson. One minute, ten seconds, and counting. We still are go at this time. Coming up on one minute, mark T minus sixty seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo Seven at this time. This is the first man test of the Saturn One B. Now pressurized, and the vehicle is go as is the spacecraft at this time. First Coming American three-man flight. T minus 40 seconds and counting. First step in the uh, final series of tests uh, to get the American on the moon by the end of 1969. Seconds and counting. We'll get ignition of those eight engines in the first stage at the three second mark in the countdown. Uh, T minus 21 seconds and counting. We have completed our power transfer. The Saturn 1B launch vehicle, which now weighs 1.3 million pounds, is ready to go. Coming up on the 10 second mark. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, we have ignition. Commit liftoff, we have liftoff. Slowly, slowly. This is launch control, we have cleared the tower. Five seconds for that sound.
Fisher, Don Arson, Robert Cunningham, the latter two making their first base flight. Lila Sherrod is third, riding that big space The voice is now at right. mission control change from Jack King to Jack King. One minute and 40 seconds. They've gone through maximum dynamic pressure. Flight director asks the flight dynamic officer if he likes it, and he says, yes, sir, it looks good. Look at the flame. 700 gallons of RP-1 and liquid oxidizer burning up there every second. That thing developing a million seconds. Coming up in two minutes, Mark, two minutes. Uh, we're having a status check. Apollo 7 has been given a go for staging. A go for staging, the separation of that uh, first stage. That comes in about 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 seconds, seconds. seconds from now. That's the first critical point after the game. Inboard engines have shut down. And both well staging. Outboard engines have shut down. Sherrod caught both events. He's got ignition and we says we're up to thrust on the second stage. That is our high door. Well, 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 it's yeah. okay at two minutes forty seconds into the flight. So the fifteenth consecutive successful flight of the S one way all of you to be that car is really jettisoned. It went way out. We're nearly 50 miles altitude now and uh, about 60 miles downrange. You see the escape tower tumbling up there in the upper hand side of the screen. into the flight. He got the separation plan from the first sex, uh, section and the sure second to stay as in that. Capcom uh, here in Houston, a very clean uh, voice communication today. Three minutes, 25 seconds into the flight. This is the best view we've ever had from our magnificent Igor camera. Victory and guidance to uh, give another go here. Of course, a little bumpy on the second stage, a little bumpy. But uh, we, can't, we can't hear any complaints. 70 miles altitude and about 120 miles downrange. The second stage burns uh, until 10 minutes and 15 seconds into the flight. Another uh, six minutes. That's a 225,000 seconds into the flight. Pound thrust engine. Sherrod sure, says the gimbal check looks very good. Well, now let's hear from our man on the spot, Michael Charlton, who was at Ted Kennedy watching that. Michael Charlton, what do you think of all that? Well, what, what you wouldn't have heard in London is uh, because there's no technique known to radio or television yet that can properly record this sound, is the enormous thunder that just breaks over. You know, when this thing lifts off, we, uh, I'm speaking to you about two miles away from the launch pad, and the sound of a bomb at first outside the, the front door here. The whole building shook. The most exciting and most exciting noise. I think I lied there for, for a long time. That's a marvelous shot you're seeing from this camera, and I hope you can still see it all those thousands of miles across the Atlantic. It's been taken from a camera about 20 miles away from here, which can see through the cloud overcast. The rocket now is traveling at over 5,000 miles an hour, and at about 160 or 70 miles down range. In another five minutes, it will be going into orbit at an altitude of 141 miles by which time it will be traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. Right. Here comes a picture, and it's white. We look at Isley, uh, a nice shot. It looks straight up and he's moving and he's really quite clear let's all have a look at it hey, you're picking up i can read it now just a minute it says from that uh lovely apollo something you guys should write high at, atop something 
Looks good. I can see Wally Hamlet now. And Don has a smile on his face and as well. Uh, the definition is pretty good down here. I can see the center hatch. It look, actually, I'm amazed. It looks real good. Hey, Don, how about saying something since you're a fan? Hey, I can read you. I can see you loud and clear. It really looks good. I'm amazed. Uh, lean back a little bit. You're too close to the camera. There you are. We'll have a special duty staffer down here directing. I forgot to shave this morning, guys. Well, it's my razor. Yeah, some of the reproductions here are real good. I can look out through Wally's rod the new window. And I can see the co-ass up there, the oil break ball. Okay, what's the next one? A little closer, Wally. So keep those cards coming. Keep those cards and letters coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. Well, slight breakdown. 
perfectly understandable when you realize just how tremendously difficult this thing is. We'll keep watching just in case we get some more. It seems to be still on the blink. One of the problems, of course, is that with, not, with no great amount of definition, because that camera is only covering about a half of the light value differences that a normal camera does, that's why you're getting this rather mushy gray color, and particularly when they point it through the camera window. Back ah, here we are again.